Dublin, Ireland, April 24th, 1916. Easter Monday dawns bright as Dubliners, both Catholic and Protestant, rouse themselves after a day of rest and worship. But some have barely slept at all, as they've spent the holiday making feverish last-minute preparations. Now, they gather their courage, faith, and guns, and converge on Dublin Castle. As the party rushes the gate, the castle garrison is minimal and unprepared for an attack. The lone policeman on duty, an Irish Catholic who is unarmed, attempts to stop them, but to no avail. An attacker guns him down as he tries to close the iron gate. But by chance, the British Undersecretary for Ireland, Sir Matthew Nathan, sees this happen. So he, along with a few soldiers, scramble to the gate, slamming it shut and locking it as bullets zip by. Then they brace for a siege, for this is no isolated attack. All across the city, armed men and women are ambushing policemen and officials, taking up sniper perches, and raising barricades. The sleepy holiday is giving way to a revolution, an Easter rising. This episode is brought to you by the incredible value proposition that is the Curiosity Stream Nebula Bundle. Seriously, so much stuff under 15 bucks, I still honestly don't believe it. But more on that awesomeness after the episode. The Easter Rising is one of the most crucial events in modern Irish history. A rebellion that had been brewing for decades and sparked a period of conflict more ferocious and dynamic than anything seen in over a century. In fact, a bare six years after Nathan tried to close the gates of Dublin Castle to the unrest brewing outside, Ireland would be a republic independent from the United Kingdom. Now, it's easy to draw a straight line from the Easter Rising to independence, to tell the tale of a popular uprising against English misrule, full of tragedy, heroism, and defiance. But while this series will talk about those things, we'll also discuss the gritty realities of how the Rising came about, what happened when the shooting started, and what changed when it stopped, all of which defy the straightforward narrative of the Republic's founding. Because, in truth, the birth of a nation is never simple. While the history of Ireland's relationship to Great Britain is complicated, the roots of the Easter Rising can be traced back to the Rebellion of 1798, when a group called the United Irishmen staged an uprising against British rule. While this would-be revolution, which included a mixture of Presbyterian Protestants and Roman Catholics, was defeated, the pressures it created paved the way for two new Acts of Union. The laws that bound Ireland to Britain, just like an earlier Act of Union, had bound Scotland and England. Chiefly, these abolished the Irish Parliament in favor of Irish representation in the British Parliament, which some hoped would increase Roman Catholic rights and allow them to serve in government. But progress toward greater Irish autonomy was slow. While there were still no uprisings to the extent of 1798, the Great Famine of the 1840s, which you can learn about after this episode in our series here, had a profound impact. With hunger killing a million Irish and forcing roughly another two million to immigrate, the famine both changed the face of Ireland and exposed the stark limitations and the frequent cruelty of British policy. A series of land reforms followed as efforts were made to stop the disaster from occurring a second time. By the 1870s, there were increased calls for Irish home rule, an idea that Ireland would practice self-governance within the United Kingdom rather than complete independence. This became the mainstream movement among Irish nationalists in the late 1800s, and there was some progress. Irish members of Parliament introduced two Home Rule Bills in 1886 and 1893, but while both failed to get past the House of Lords, a third attempt succeeded in 1914. That was because, in the 1910 general election, the pro-Home Rule Irish Parliamentary Party ended up with a powerful voting bloc. Now, we don't have enough time in this series to get into the entire tangled yarn basket of Irish politics and factionalism in the early 20th century, but broadly speaking, there were two opposed groups. The Unionists, who were content with Ireland's place within the United Kingdom, and the Nationalists, who wanted some form of independence from Great Britain. The Nationalists originally believed in peaceful change, but by the early 1900s, a range of nationalist organizations advocated an uprising. But even among these militants, visions of independence differed. Some wanted Ireland to leave the United Kingdom, but remain in the Commonwealth and retain George V as king, while others wanted a complete break and the creation of an Irish Republic. There were also debates about what should be done with the vehemently Unionist north of the island. Should it be incorporated or remain part of the UK? And many disagreed over the role of the Roman Catholic Church after separation and whether the new country should adopt the socialist or even communist ideas sweeping Europe. Then on the other side of that divided divide, the thought of home rule caused unrest among Irish unionists, especially in the north, where Protestantism and unionism went hand in hand. 
Irish Protestants feared that even limited independence would result in the erosion of their culture or a purge at the hands of the nationalists. To combat this, Irish Unionists formed a paramilitary organization, the Ulster Volunteer Force, or UVF. Within months, there were over 100,000 members willing to take up arms and defend their Britishness, whether the actual British government wanted them to or not. For instance, on the 25th of April 1914, the UVF successfully smuggled almost 25,000 rifles into Ulster. Predictably enough, the existence of this large Protestant militia worried Irish nationalists, who responded by forming their own paramilitary army, the Irish Volunteers. It seemed the board was being set for civil war, but as so often has been the case throughout history, just as conflict seemed inevitable, external events overturned the playing pieces. In 1914, an archduke died in Sarajevo, and Britain became embroiled in the First World War. Hundreds of thousands of Irishmen, Protestants and Catholics, nationalists and unionists put aside their differences to enlist in the British army. The UVF signed up in droves, forming an entire army division that would go on to fight across the Western Front. And with the war seemingly diffusing the tensions at home, home rule went to the back burner. But not everyone shifted focus. For while many Irishmen supported the British war effort, some nationalists saw a world war as the perfect opportunity to strike. Hoth, Ireland, July 26, 1914. In broad daylight, a ship pulls up to the docks, met by a group of Irish men and women equipped with wheelbarrows and carts. Among them is Countess Markovich, the first woman to be elected to the British Parliament. Under her direction and the other leaders of the group, the ship starts unloading its cargo, 1,500 Mauser rifles. Markovich and those assisting her are Irish nationalists. With the Irish Unionist UVF now armed, thanks to their own gun-running operation, the Nationalists are trying to keep up. But the news of guns being taken away in wheelbarrows spread quickly, and police and soldiers mobilized to halt the illegal drop-off. A crowd gathers shouting, someone throws a punch, and a brawl ensues. Amidst the confusion, most of the guns make it ashore, disappearing under floorboards and into attics to be retrieved later. The Irish volunteers were now armed. A revolt was simmering, and there was one group determined to make it boil over. The Irish Republican Brotherhood, or IRB, had formed in 1858 as a secretive, oath-bound fraternal organization dedicated to creating an Irish Republic. It was one of the main backers of the Irish Volunteers, though it didn't fully control them, and was advocating for an armed uprising. And while rebellion was generally approved of, senior individuals of the IRB found themselves at odds with each other over the specifics. Some believed the time was not yet right for a rising, while others wished to press ahead. And unbeknownst to much of the IRB, a small militant faction within its own ranks, calling itself the Military Council, had tasked itself with planning the rebellion. The Council kept these designs secret, not only from the authorities, but from other nationalists who might seek to delay it. Distrust and uncertainty were rife. But this potential uprising was fraught with risk. British military power was overwhelming, even with troops stripped for the war. So some decided it would be wise to even the odds by winning some foreign backing. And now that Germany was at war with Britain, the country seemed like the perfect ally for the nationalist movement, and courting assistance from the Kaiser became imperative. To that end, Irish nationalist and former British diplomatic consul Sir Roger Casement was dispatched in secret to negotiate with the Germans in New York and Berlin. If he was successful, German arms and ammunition would flood Ireland, and German soldiers would land in the west of the country, then march on Dublin amid an open rebellion. So as Irish volunteer fighters took their rifles from hidden lofts, they were preparing not just to strike a blow for Ireland, but also for a German victory in the First World War. And if you'd like to learn more about the Easter Rising before next week's episode, I said if you'd like to learn more about the Easter Rising before next week's episode, Casual Matt, that's your cue. Ah, sorry, presenter voice Matt, full disclosure. I finished watching this episode yesterday early and ad-free on Nebula. Now I'm watching this curiosity stream doc, though, if you'd like to get in on that. Wait, what are we doing? Actually, we were just about to tell the folks at home just how awesome both of those streaming services are. If that's the case, would you want me to talk about it, considering I'm the one who watches these things? I think that'd be great. I will never know how you were so chipper all the time. Okay, um, <laughs> so if you don't already know, Nebula is a creator-owned streaming service made up of folks like us at Extra Credits, Half as Interesting, Low Spec Gamer, The Great War, and honestly, just a ton of independent creators that basically lets all of us sort of take control of our own destinies because every one of us has a seat at the table and can actually get a say on how the platform is run, which is super helpful when we want to create great content. 
And real talk for a second, that great content is because of all of you who have already subscribed to Nebula. Because of your support, we can put every video up there early, including all of ours completely ad-free. And you've allowed so many creators just to make a ton of cool Nebula originals, like Real Life Lore's uh, Modern Conflict series that I watch incessantly every time a new episode drops. I even moved my own personal podcast, the only podcast about movies, there is an asterisk in that title, I assure you, and done a few originals myself because I truly do believe in what we're trying to build over at Nebula. But what's actually really cool is our friends over at Curiosity Stream believe I am right about this and have basically teamed up with us over at Nebula to offer what I think in my heart of hearts is a just phenomenal deal in streaming, especially in the current landscape. When you sign up for Curiosity Stream, using our link in the description, of course, you get a matching Nebula subscription for free. Now that is a full membership, not a trial or anything, keep in mind. Which basically means that not only do you get Curiosity Streams, thousands of big budget nonfiction films and videos and award-winning original series, but you also get amazing content from a bunch of my absolute favorite creators on the internet, all for less than 15 bucks a year. Case in point, since you just watched the first Easter Rising episode, while you wait for Ep 2, you might be interested in a show they have over there called Revolution in Color. It's this Curiosity Stream doc that tells the story of Ireland's struggle for independence during the early decades of the 20th century, and the real-life footage alone is worth the price of admission. It ups it to the absolute next level. I really enjoyed it. So uh, that's pretty much it. Two great streaming services, one low price, yada, yada, yada. Yo, presenter Matt, did I forget anything? Well, you could tell them exactly how they get all this goodness. True, 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 true. Though that kind of sounds more like a you thing. So I'm gonna go watch more working titles, and you can take care of that. Fair enough. All you gotta do is head over to curiositystream.com slash extra credits right now to get both of these phenomenal streaming services for only $14.97 for an entire year. That's 26% off the regular price, which still does blow my mind. And when you do, not only will you get to watch some of the best content on this old series of tubes, but you'll also be directly helping out our channel in the process. And I know I speak for both of us, even though he left, when I say thank you for the support. Thanks! A hearty thanks of legend to Ahmed Ziad Turk, Alicia Bramble, Angelo Valenciana, Arclight Games, Casey Muscha, Dominic Valenciana, Joseph Blame, and Skylar Holmes.